All right, so let's pick it up and talk about the cardiopulmonary system. Cardiopulmonary, where these two systems work together to bring oxygen and nutrients to the cell. The blood, when we look at the blood, the plasma, the liquid part of the blood, so the, the part that you see, if you were to separate the plasma from the red blood cells, it would be sort of yellowish looking. The red blood cells, when we think of red blood cells, we should think in this class of oxygen delivery devices. They're like little buses that deliver oxygen to the cells. So if we don't have enough blood for some reason, if we're bleeding out, what are we missing? Red blood cells, which are missing what? Oxygen. Right. And what else does the blood do? So we'd be missing oxygen and what? You're right, pressure. So it gives, provides oxygen and then pressure. So we have an oxygen delivery device, but we also have the blood in there. The liquid part of the blood gives a certain pressure. So we have to have both. White blood cells fight infection, and then the platelets are uh, smaller sort of broken up cells that aid in clotting. So when we look at plasma and this pressure, we want to say hydrostatic. Hydro meaning what? Water. So you have the plasma pressure, then you have a certain amount of water that is in there. And inside and outside the cell, there's this constant battle of the pressure because you have a in intracellular pressure, intra meaning or intravascular pressure. So you have a certain amount of pressure inside the vessel, okay? And then you have interstitial pressure, inter meaning between. So you have the fluid inside, which is intra, and then interstitial fluid, which is on the outside. So the vessel and the cells are surrounded by fluid, and then there's this constant moving of this fluid back and forth to, to maintain fluid balance. So when things take place, we get dehydrated, all right, or something happens within the cell, we start leaking fluid from the cells, then we get an imbalance of fluid back and forth. And that's essentially what congestive heart failure does. In the capillaries, you get this uh, imbalance in the capillaries, and then fluid starts to sort of leak out of the cell. And then we get into the interstitial between the cell, and that's where we get the edema or the swelling. Seen patients with the bico cankles, you know, uh, congestive heart failure patients. So you get that swelling in their lower extremities. Now, if the swelling was in the lungs, what would they have? Pulmonary edema. Pulmonary edema right? They'd have fluid within the lungs, so they'd have pulmonary edema. And we'll look at both of those. All are a result of the differences in pressure of that fluid. Then, like we've talked about just now, hypovolemia, hypo-low volemia volume, so you have less volume there, so you don't have as much red blood cells to pass on, so you lose gas exchange. Anemia, fewer blood cells, so fewer, fewer oxygen carriers, right? And then the difference in the waters, in the proteins and the, and the nutrients we get in, in the water. Sodium, sodium's really big and uh, works with the renal system as far as being able to balance water and fluids. So once you get a little bit further into all this, it, it becomes quite complicated, right? Uh, fortunately for us, in the EMT part of this, we, we try to keep it simple. You know, 
uh, it's, it's a lot more simpler than what all this goes into, which you'll be pleased with. So we look at this blood vessel. Let's say that this is in a, a capillary bed, so you have enough bilis sitting right here, okay? So blood is being pumped from the heart to this alveolus because it's deoxygenated. So it's coming down here, into the, it enters into the capillary system, and this, this blood here is high in carbon dioxide, right? Inside this alveolus is high in oxygen. So as soon as that blood passes through there, all at once, it's going to take place. We have to slow it down and, and break it up. But all at once, oxygen is going to diffuse across here because this is low in oxygen. And carbon dioxide, as it travels through there, it's going to diffuse into the alveolus because the alveolus is low in carbon dioxide, correct? So you get the pressure changes in the gas, and now it's going to be picked up on the other side and transported back to the heart, pumped through the uh, left side of the heart, the atrium, and then the left ventricle, out the aorta to the rest of the body, correct? So let's say we get down to the little toe. Now we're on the other side. Oxygenated blood's coming back down to the little toe through here because here's the toe and it's used up all of its oxygen supply. So as it enters into the little toe capillary bed, it's high in oxygen. This is low in oxygen, so that's going to diffuse across. And then it's high in carbon dioxide, and this is low in carbon dioxide, and it's going to move across, back and forth like that. So the effusion takes place everywhere. It just depends on every capillary bed. It just depends on where it's at, right? Capillary bed is a capillary bed. Pulmonary capillary bed, the capillaries just happen to surround an alveolus. A little toe capillary bed... It just surrounds the little toe with the tissue. Does everybody have a good handle on the diffusion process? Can you go back to the blood dysfunction? Just one before I go. So what takes place here is you have this pressure, or blood pressure, capillary pressure, depending on what vessel it's in. So you have this pressure in there. We have these different stretch receptors inside the vessel to sort of monitor the pressure, and the, that allows the blood or the vessel to increase and decrease according to the need. So increasing would be vasodilation, right? What would be decreasing? Vasoconstriction. Right, vasoconstriction. So the blood, the, uh, the blood vessels will dilate and constrict as needed. And then there's a good picture of See, there's sort of a normal vessel sort of filled with fluid, and then for some reason, this vessel dilates, and as you can, the same way with the lungs, the pressure in here decreases, right? So when the, the vessels dilate, the pressure decreases inside the vessel as long as the volume remains the same. What law is that? boils, yeah. It sort of, it boils, deals with gas, but it works the same, the principle's the same with this. And we get this sort of strange vasodilation in infection, when we, later we'll talk about shock, and we get an infection, sepsis, have y'all ever heard of septic shock, sepsis? Someone's really sick, the toxins in their blood makes their vessels dilate, allergic reaction, little bee stings you, you're allergic to bee stings, and then the histamines in there causes vasodilation, which leads to what kind of shock? Anaphylactic shock. Right, good. So that's sort of the, the thing that we'll get into there when we talk about uh, vessel dysfunction.
as far as the dilating and, and constriction of the vessel. When we talk about congestive heart failure, we talk about this. We talk about the vessels, the capillaries sort of leaking fluid out. And they leak fluid out because of the different pressures. The pressure in the capillary and the pressure in the interstitial fluid. When it builds up due to by congestive heart failure, when the capillaries build up fluid and there's more fluid in the capillaries than there, there is in the interstitial space, the fluid's going to go from the capillaries into the interstitial space, correct? Because the difference is in pressure. Always from a higher pressure to a lower pressure. That's the way everything moves, gas and fluid. What's the osmosis, osmosis right? Moves through sort of osmosis, fluid. Then we get into these other stranger things that we talk about systematic vascular resistance and, you know, uh, which leads into hypertension where the vascular system starts to constrict and the blood pressure goes up. Uh, the body controls a lot of that. Then you get dysfunctions in there that, that can cause hypertension. Questions? Questions there? About the vessels? All right, we got, let me, we'll go quickly through the heart. I don't think we have much more and we'll take a break. The heart pumps out 60 to 70. I like this, I like, it says 60 here, but I think it's closer to 70. Remember stroke volume? The term, that's what this top term means. This, well, pump out with stroke volume. Stroke volume is the output of blood out of the ventricles with each contraction. So you have about 60 to 70 milliliters of blood that's being pumped out with each contraction. Now this is based on the preload, which is the amount of blood coming back to the heart on the venous side, or you can also say uh, venous return right here. They're pretty close. So preload or venous return how the heart contracts or the contractility of the heart and then after load is the amount of pressure that it, the heart has to overcome to force the blood out of the, out of the heart. So we have after load, preload is here, all right? It's the amount of blood or the pressure here, the resistance of blood coming back to the heart. After load, you get the aorta right here. There's already blood in the aorta, correct? I mean, it never goes dry, so you can still have blood in the aorta. Okay, uh, trying to make a D. Afterload, when we look at afterload, afterload is the amount of force that it takes to pump blood out of the left ventricle. So the left ventricle is pushing blood out through the aortic valve into the aorta, and it's the amount of pressure that it has to overcome to push blood into the aorta, because there's already blood there in the aorta. So it has to overcome a certain amount of pressure to push the new supply of blood in there. Does everybody see the way that works? And that's called afterload and preload. Not a great deal. We don't, we don't necessarily have to do a great deal of work with afterload and preload, but, but some. So stroke volume is the heart rate or cardiac output, I'm sorry, cardiac output is the stroke volume, which is an average of 70, 60 to 70, times your heart rate will give you cardiac output. Cardiac output, or CO, abbreviation, is the amount of blood that the body puts out in one minute. And the average cardiac output is what? Average. Yeah, four to six liters. Somewhere in there. 
Good. So, when we look at these different dysfunctions, as we get into more of the, let's treat this, heart rate is one of the first things we look at. Always look at rate. At a paramedic level, we look at rate, rhythm, and pressure. So we look at the heart rate, we look at the rhythm that the heart is in, and then the blood pressure. The blood pressure is always last. Since you guys can't get look at the rhythm, think of rate and pressure. Rate first, then blood pressure. The blood pressure will is last to change. The blood pressure is not a good indicator right away of things taking place in the body. The heart rate is. The heart rate will tell you a lot. If I'm dehydrated, I'm going to have an increased heart rate. If I'm hypo, hypovolemic, increased heart rate. Difficulty breathing, increased heart rate. In pain, increased heart rate. That's how we tell when people are really in pain, is that their heart rate's going to be elevated. You know, if they're saying, they're saying, oh, i got 10 over 10 on this pain scale, and your heart rate's, you know, 70, really, probably not. Your heart rate's going to be elevated with pain. One of the key factors that we look at. All right, so mechanical problems, trauma, heart's not contracting right, cellular death, heart attacks, and trauma, we have a uh, cardiac tamponade, uh, where the blood, the, the pericardium's filling with blood, we can have a cardiac contusion, or you can have electrical problems within the heart as well that starts having cardiac dysrhythmias where the rate is going to be messed up. So there's quite a bit of problems that we'll look at. When we look at uh, the respiratory system, we could have what's called a VQ mismatch. And a VQ mismatch is ventilation, which is at the cell, correct, in perfusion. So in the easiest way to explain a VQ mismatch is through a pulmonary embolism. You're just, in a pulmonary embolism, you just can't use the oxygen that you're getting. There's this mis mismatch where you're flooding them with oxygen, but they can't use it because of that embolism. So you have a mismatch there. What's happening to the oxygen? Nothing, they're just not using it. And we'll talk about that a lot more when we get into pulmonary embolism. Then shock. Shock is just the, the body's inability really to maintain a pressure or to perfuse. So you have different kinds of shock. Hypovolemic shock, cardiogenic shock, septic shock, anaphylactic shock. We've already mentioned uh, that one where you get scared. Psychogenic shock. You see something you really don't like and you go, oh, and people faint. That's, that's psychogenic shock. And then when you look at hypoperfusion, shock and hypoperfusion are essentially the same thing. So as you get into this, you look at that. But we'll talk about, we'll have a lot of time to talk about the different forms of shock and what takes place. But fortunately, for the patients and us, is we always have an a ability to compensate for these different things. And typically, through increasing heart rate. Increase the rate, I'm telling you, it's so important. We increase the rate, increase the pressure, increase the respiratory rate, we're going to increase the heart rate. So as we move through these different different emergencies that are in the next probably, what, 10, 15 chapters of the book, this is what we'll be speaking of as we go through there.